Well, in the previous slide where we had the discussion of SQL and NoSQL databases, I introduced the concept of partitioning for the NoSQL database. Data is partitioned either for size, you have so much data that it will not fit on a single machine, that you have to partition it and put some of the data on one machine, some of the data on another machine, some of the data on a third machine, and so on. Or you might partition data not for size, but instead for speed. You might have very little data, but the, you access that data constantly, and so that one machine is being accessed very, very frequently, and it can't handle the performance requirements. So you might put some of the data on one machine and some of the data on another machine, even though it's not a lot of data, but this way some of the, half the requests go to machine one, half the requests go to machine two, so that they can be processed in parallel, thereby improving your performance. And of course you might partition data in order to get both of these. You might have large data and you might have speed requirements, and you'll use partitioning in order to uh, solve both of these problems. In my experience, and from many of the services that I've built or I've worked with customers, this is the absolute hardest part about architecting a service, is figuring out the best way to partition the data. Um, you really want to not compromise on this. You want to spend a lot of time thinking through the kind of data you have, what's being stored in that data, what are the access patterns for the data, do you need to have sorts on that data, can you live with indexes on that data? Can you live with just filtered views of that data? So it doesn't have to be sorted, but we can filter down to a subset that's more manageable. Do I access this kind of data and this piece of data frequently at the same time? If I modify them, do I modify them at the same time or only one at a time? Do I, would I need to do it atomically as a transaction or can they not be atomically done as a transaction? This kind of stuff, you really, really wanna think through heavily, and then you want to then choose a database engine that's going to give you the kind of characteristics that you think you need. Then I would recommend that you incubate this problem. In other words, set up that database engine, put some data into it, write all the code for the access patterns that you're going to need. You have to write that code eventually anyway, write it first. Then have that code run, load your databases with a bunch of dummy data in it, test the performance, test the size, Make sure it's working for you before you go fully all in on the design of the rest of the architecture. Really think this through, really do your due diligence, because when you make a mistake on this or you find out later that you didn't do it in an optimal way, it is very, very painful to go and change it, especially if you're trying to change it in a live service. If you have the luxury of saying, we didn't do this right, we'd like to change it, we're gonna take our service offline and then we're gonna migrate all the data with no customers accessing our service into this different form and then bring it back up. If you have that luxury of doing that, then great for you, consider yourself incredibly lucky, and then you can maybe afford to make a mistake or two. But a lot of people don't have that luxury and trying to change this while customers are trying to access the data and you're trying to restructure the data, that's called a, like a live migration of the data is what that's called, very, very painful thing to do very hard to get it right. So really do due diligence and take your time. Um, realize that cross partition operations require additional network hops. So if you do have to perform an operation that goes across partitions, there is going to be some additional latency or performance hit that's gonna sneak its way into that. Um, and you know it might be fine enough for you and you can live with it, for many people it is, but it might not be. Again, you have to think that through. Um, if you have different pieces of data in different partitions and you want to update them atomically with a single transaction, in many databases that's impossible. They don't even allow distributed transactions across partitions. So if you need to manipulate multiple pieces of data as a transacted unit, most likely the database engine that you're using is going to require that it all be in the, those multiple pieces of data reside in the same partition. So if you are optimizing for transactions, then you are basically de-optimizing for partitioning the data. If you're optimizing for partitioning, then you're effectively de-optimizing for transactions. And that's the whole thing with this database, is that when you're optimizing for one thing, you are by definition making it harder to do something else. It's a very hard set of trade-offs that uh, we have to deal with when we're architecting these systems.
How many partitions that you need also frequently depends on how much data that you will have in the future. Right? We're trying to build these systems so that they scale. When you're working on version one, you probably have no initial customers. So you don't really know how many customers are going to be accessing your service. So you may be thinking in terms of small scale. But if your service does well and you gain more customers, you could grow with several orders of magnitude. By the end of the first year, you might have tens of thousands of customers. The end of the next year, you might have millions. Then end of the year after that, you might have tens of millions. And if you're storing data for all those customers, now your data needs has also grown uh, you know, by orders of magnitude over just a couple years time. So you want to think about the future too when you're designing this. Think about how many customers you ever think you might expect. Think about how much data that you're going to be storing per customer. And think about how your partitions will fill on those various machines because you might want to partition into a thousand partitions today even though you're only going to, each partition might be very thinly loaded, right, not heavily loaded, but you're planning for the future where they may get loaded substantially more a couple years down the road, right? Um, this is, again, what makes this like the hardest thing to do when architecting a system. Now, in addition to partitioning the data, your data also is going to be replicated. And we replicate the data for reliability reasons. Uh, one replica of the data might be on a piece of hardware that fails, and if that's the only place where you have your data, then you've lost all your data. So we replicate the data to avoid that kind of failure. Replicating state increases the chance of data surviving one or more simultaneous failures. Right? And don't forget that these failures are not always failures. Sometimes they're on purpose. For example, if you have your data stored in a machine, and then that machine gets an operating system upgrade and the machine reboots, well, if you only had one replica in that machine, that replica is at least offline for the amount of time it takes for that machine to upgrade its OS and for it to reboot. So by having another replica, we could do a leader election. One of those uh, replicas is the leader, but that one's being upgraded and rebooting. We can elect a different replica to now become the leader where all the requests come into it. Then this other machine can reboot, maybe uh, maybe the leader will go back or maybe the leader will stay. That, that depends on how the database works. Um, but you get the idea. By having multiple replicas, it's not just about failure. This is a normal process of rebooting this machine, but you would like to still have access to your data while that's going on. Um, now imagine that you're rebooting one machine and the other machine has a hardware failure. So now both replicas are down. So now you probably want to have three replicas so that you can tolerate you know, uh, these, I call them failures, but they're not always failures. Um, so then you might say, well, then let's have lots of replicas. I should have 1,000 replicas or 2,000 replicas. Well, why don't we have that many? The reason why you don't want to have an infinite number of replicas is because each replica is going to cost you money. You have data there. You have to store the data. That's not completely free, of course. And then when you want to change a piece of data, you have to replicate it to all the other replicas. That's going to cause a lot of network traffic to go on the wire, and that increases latency to all the other replicas. So that's the reason why you want to think about the number of replicas you have too. This is usually a much easier problem than figuring out the partitioning problem. In fact, usually what people do is for replicas, they say three or maybe four or five, and that's about it. Right? Usually people replicate their data somewhere between three and five times. Um, for some scenarios, though, data loss is actually okay. So um, if you're doing, let's say, an IoT, you know, Internet of Things scenario, where you have a bunch of thermostats in a bunch of buildings, and every five seconds the thermostat says, I'm at 68 degrees, I'm at 68 degrees, I'm at 68 degrees. Well, if you store that data in a replica, and let's say it's only one replica, and you lost that replica, well, five seconds later, the thermostat's going to report 68 degrees again. So you could say, well, I'm willing to uh, run my service more inexpensively by having only one replica of the data. And if that data happens to go away, the IoT devices, they're going to reach back into me soon and give me the latest update of the data. So I can repopulate it from other sources. Right? So now I can run my service cheaply, 
and it's unlikely I'll have failure or lose it. You know, and that's a business decision that you have to make to how important having these replicas are for you. If you do have multiple replicas, they are usually placed across different fault domains um, and across different update domains as well. And this avoids a single point of failure. We talked about fault domains in the very beginning of the course where you would probably put different replicas um, at least in different racks, if not in different availability zones, or maybe even in different regions around the globe. So if a region somewhere went away in the United States, a region somewhere in Europe might have the other replica. Of course, the further away the replicas are from each other, the higher the latency is in replicating the data when everything is working successfully. So, the, you know, the, this whole cloud architecture stuff is very much a lot of um, good news here and bad news, right? And then you have to weigh w what you care about most, right? I like having the replicas for disaster recovery, but I don't like the latency of the replication. Um, they come together as a pair, so you have to decide you know, what's more important to you there. Um, and replicas can also improve speed if you're willing to sacrifice some consistency. And what I mean by this is that if you have multiple replicas, instead of having all uh, read requests go to, let's say, a primary replica, some read requests can go here and some read requests can go there. So now, uh, to this other replica, so now these two replicas can handle read requests in parallel at the same time, thereby improving your performance. But I do say this comes at the cost of sacrificing some consistency. It could be that somebody's changing a value, let's say there's a value of 5 in both replicas, and somebody wants to change the 5 to a 10. So that's going to go to this replica to change it to a 10, and then it has, the 10 has to go across the wire to be replicated here, but if another request comes in, this might get the 5 back and not the 10, all depending on timing. So, if, so there's some inconsistency of the data. And you know, that's another thing that you can contend with. I'm willing to have better performance in order to compromise some consistency. Uh, actually, this uh, animated slide will very much walk through what I was just talking about with the replication and the consistency. Uh, this talks how replication occurs, and what I'm showing you in this example here is the scenario where everything is working perfectly. There's no failure case at all. So we're getting consistency and we're getting availability of the data. So let's say right now we have three replicas for our data, and they all have the value of AAA in all three of these replicas. Now these three replicas could be in the same data center, but they might be in different availability zones, or they might be in different data centers across the globe, different regions across the globe. Uh, the only thing that would change would be the performance of updating these replicas. A client request comes in where it goes and hits a load balancer. The load balancer then says, okay, we're trying to change the piece of data to a BBB. That's what's coming in, is we want to update this data to BBB. So it comes up, I'm oh, sorry, comes into the first replica. The first replica says, okay, I see you want to change this to a BBB. I'm going to send the BBBs out to the both other replicas, and that happens simultaneously. Right, so these two other secondary replicas, if you will, they've been told that we're trying to change the data to BBB, and then they go and they update it. The first one updates to BBB and returns the result back to the primary replica. The secondary over here, it updates to BBB and returns the result back to the primary replica. Then the primary updates to BBB as well. So now all three replicas have changed the data from AAA to BBB, and now we can return a result back to the client. Right, so this is how those replicas all get updated and stay in sync with one another. And this shows you what happens when everything is working fine, which is, of course, the normal case, when everything is working fine. But a little bit later, um, I will be talking about what happens when failures start to get introduced into this story.